And good evening. Top story live tonight from Edinburgh, Scotland, the first city in the world where the public will be able to pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth and her coffin is brought to St. Giles Cathedral just behind me here in this capital city. And now the UK is welcoming a new king at the same time. On the first full day of his reign, King Charles met with massive crowds at Buckingham Palace, some chanting God save the king as he arrived at the royal residence in the state Rolls Royce. Just 24 hours after his mother died, the king getting emotional as he stopped at a growing memorial at the palace gates, now tasked with leading a nation through grief while living with his own. That job starting with the first public address as king. During the nine-minute speech, he paid respects to his mother, the queen, while laying out his commitment to continue her life of service. The king also officially announcing the new roles and titles of William and Kate, his other son, now next in line. However, the changing monarchy will be met with old challenges, including some faltering public support at home and abroad. But for now, the love for the queen on full display around the world, both Harry Styles and Elton John stopping their shows to honor her. And here's a live look tonight at Buckingham Palace, where people are still laying flowers and paying tribute while ushering in a new royal era. Tonight, the eyes of the world on King Charles III. Queen Elizabeth's firstborn son, boarding a flight out of Scotland, where he had rushed to be by his mother's side in her final moments. The first King of England in more than 70 years, touching down just outside of London. The grieving son headed to meet the grieving masses outside of Buckingham Palace. Possibly the first time King Charles has heard that phrase. His motorcade met with a roar of applause. The man known for so many years and to so many millions as a prince. God save the king! Stepping into the role he spent his entire life preparing for. The king, dressed in a black suit, still mourning his mother, but making his way down the row of supporters, consoling him, but also cheering him on. A handshake, a shared smile, and even a kiss for the new monarch, providing a brief reprieve from their sadness. Then, a somber rendition of God Save the King. King Charles with wife Camilla at his side, pausing for a quiet moment. Taking in the tributes laid down for his mother. Before entering the palace that will soon become his home, among the thousands gathered outside the gates, mixed emotions. I'm feeling up and down, sad, joyful. I think everyone's gonna miss her quite greatly. Those sentiments echoed by Charles himself acknowledging the pain of a nation in his first public address as king. I speak to you today with feelings of profound sorrow. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. With an enormous weight on his shoulders, King Charles vowing to meet the moment, recalling a promise made by his mother on her 21st birthday. Just four years before she would become queen. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family. Her son, now the oldest monarch to assume the throne, making that same commitment at age 73. As the Queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. The King formally announcing new titles for the royal family. Camilla, his wife of 17 years, now Queen Consort. I count on the loving help of my darling wife, Camilla, in recognition of her own loyal public service since our marriage 17 years ago, she becomes my queen consort. I know she will bring to the demands of her new role the steadfast devotion to duty, 
on which I have come to rely so much. William, who has grown up in front of the world's eyes, will replace his father as Prince of Wales, now first in line for the throne. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wissog Cymru, the country whose title I have been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations. The King briefly mentioning his youngest son Harry and his wife Meghan Markle, whose relationship with the royal family has grown strained since stepping away from official duties last year. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. Charles speaking to the thousands of supporters gathered outside and around the world. On behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. Before ending with a poignant message to his beloved mother. And to my darling mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late papa, I want simply to say this. Thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And joining us now for more on King Charles III's new reign, I want to bring in senior international correspondent Keir Simmons, who joins Top Story tonight from London. So, Keir, I want to ask you, I want to pick up where that story left off there, that last minute of the King's speech. A, a lot of people are saying that was the most vulnerable, maybe the most emotional they've ever seen King Charles. Is that true? And, and what were your takeaways from the speech? Well, what you saw there, Tom, was a, a man in mourning, a, a man looking to the loss of his mom. He was in the blue drawing room there at Buckingham Palace where she recorded many of her uh, Christmas televised messages, a picture of her by his side. I think it was genuine. He is an emotional man. And I think you, you really saw it in that message. He let it show. And I think that he will think that that's important because he wants to be more than just a monarch. He wants to connect with people. And I think that's what he was trying to do today there. All the same, though, it was a genuine genuine emotion. Of course, his mother died just yesterday. That Keir, you know, before the speech, there also seems to be a moment that is resonating around the world, and it's when King Charles got out of that Rolls Royce and he greeted the crowd for the first time as king. And, and you could see it on his face. You could see it in the crowd. People were sad. They were mourning the loss of Queen Elizabeth. But there was also some joy there that, that they were meeting the new king. Yeah. And you could almost see it on Charles's face as well. What, what was your, your takeaway? Well, he stepped out of that car and stepped into history, didn't he? You have to pinch yourself when you see him, that this man, who we've always known as Prince Charles, is now King Charles. And, you know, I think walking over and meeting the people was a deliberate act. He is a politician as well as being a, a royal. You have to be. He knows that the message that he wants to send is that he can connect with people, that he will be a king for the people. And just visually going over and being with people like that, that was a visual way to say that to people uh, very, very clearly. And I think you're right, Tom, you know, a day of mixed emotions, of mourning for his mother, of celebrating his mother, of enjoying her, her sense of humor. And also, and, and so many folks who have lost a loved one will recognize this, th that kind of mixed emotion, the, the sadness and the happiness. But it is so true when it comes to the, the passing of the monarch. Monarchy, people singing God save uh, the king, calling out God save the king and, and greeting him and, and looking to the future. And again, th that is what he would want to see. And I think what his mom would want to see. Kier, you know, in one of the episodes of your podcast where you talk about 
uh, Prince Charles and then who eventually now is King Charles. You, you, you talk a lot about his, his younger life and, and how he was at times ridiculed. You know, he, there's the famous yeah. quote of him saying that he speaks to his plants. And, and for yeah. many years he was laughed at, but today it, it seems people aren't laughing at him anymore. Do you think he's meeting the moment um, and, and, and he's just come a long way in those years as prince and now king? Well, what he wants you to know, and we're going to see because there are a lot of years ahead, but he wants you to know that he is moving into a, a new role. He said in his speech today, my life will change. He said, suggested that he will no longer be able to advocate for the charities and the issues that he's advocated for in the past. The issue about a political monarch is that one day his politics may be good and people might like it, but of course, times change. The next day, it can be different. Now, when it comes to the environment, that's really worked for him. But ultimately, what he does need to do is take a page out of his mom's book and, and rise above politics. The tricky thing, of course, is to know when to intervene a little. But you know another thing we saw today, Tom? We saw him meet uh, with the prime minister. Those meetings behind closed doors now are his opportunity to guide the leader of this country, not tell them what to do, but to give them his wise counsel. His mom does that, did that, and I think he will enjoy the opportunity to do that now. Right, it's where he's going to really rise to the occasion. Finally, here, you, you, you are our interpreter in these royal matters at times. And even though we both speak English here, I'm going to ask for your, your help in interpreting something. The phrase queen consort, what exactly does that right. mean? If you can explain it to our viewers. So a queen is a sovereign, a monarch in power. A queen, queen's consort uh, is the, the wife of, of a king. Uh, and it, it, if you remember back with, with Queen Elizabeth and Philip, Philip was never called king because he was the husband of the queen. So you can't be simply king or simply queen unless you are the head of this constitutional monarchy. I hope that helps. It does, Keir. Keir Simmons, our king of correspondence. And as I mentioned, Keir has a podcast. It's called Born to be King. Born to rule, I should say. When Charles is king, Keir talks to royal insiders who have followed Charles for decades. Okay. And Charles has already lived a life of service, largely in the shadow of his mother, the queen, known for decades as Prince of Wales. This now is his chance to reintroduce himself to people as king. Richard Engels at Baltimore Castle with more. God save the king! Groomed for decades, this was the moment King Charles waited for his entire life. His first speech as monarch. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived. And he made it clear, promise, like his yes. mother, he promised to never give up the post until death. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Charles ascends to the throne at 73, the longest wait in British history. The decades have given him many strengths, experience, patience, preparation, but weaknesses too. Charles has struggled with personal popularity in his role as the Prince of Wales. I think he made a big step forward today. I think people now will look to him after that speech which, with much more sympathy than they felt before. Charles grew up at his mother's side, but her popularity never quite rubbed off, but signs today that her passing may have opened hearts to him. I think the reception he's had at Buckingham Palace today gives me great hope that the monarchy will continue for many years. King Charles became the Prince of Wales at 20. He was a pilot in the Air Force and commanded a ship in the Royal Navy. With this ring, I thee wed. I thee wed. He was 32 when he married Lady Diana Spencer. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Charles was soon in the shadow of a star. It was a dark time for him and the royal family of divorce and Diana's death. Charles turned to campaigning for the environment and remarried, this time to his old love, Camilla. He took on more royal duties as his mother's health faded. And he's learned the power of charisma already turning to his popular son, William, and his wife. He's going to use William, who is very popular, to take up the causes that he will no longer be able to go so public about, I think will also be very much in his favor. The next generation of British kings is in line. No queens on the horizon. Charles, William, and George 
seen together during the late Queen's Jubilee. A new chapter begins for a king with vast preparation and a history. Richard Engel joins us tonight from Balmoral Castle. Richard, of course, there is this grace period now that he has become king, but there is a perception, there are opinions. Everyone knows he's not nearly as popular as his mother was, but do you think he's going to be able to change opinions and change perceptions in this nation's and others? So he's already 73 years old. He's not going to have 70 years to form a bond with the people of this country, but he has already uh, been well known here for decades. He is already a household name, and that has both advantages and disadvantages. Um, on the advantages front, he's experienced. People know who he is. Uh, he has a tremendous amount of, 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 of grace in this position. He's very comfortable with it. Uh, but people also have formed strong opinions about him, and they know the history with Diana. They know his opinions on everything from, from science to, 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 to medicine to the environment. Uh, and he clearly, based on what we saw today at Buckingham Palace, wants to engage with the public. Uh, he was out glad-handing people in front of the palace, uh, which is something that uh, the late queen didn't do toward the end of her life, wasn't comfortable doing for, for many years now, uh, was never quite comfortable with in the digital age, according to uh, people who are close to her, didn't like that people could walk up right uh, next to someone and take a picture or take a selfie with you. There were many cell phones in that crowd, and uh, King Charles seemed quite uh, familiar with that environment. So he clearly wants to reach out and form this bond with the, with, with the people of this nation, and from what we saw today, they want to form that that bond with him as well. Richard Engel for us tonight from Balmoral Castle. Richard, we appreciate that. And for a closer look into the royal family and what the future of the British monarchy really looks like, I want to bring in live with me here Miko Cleland. He's a British royal expert, a genealogist, and he's also the director of content at My Heritage. And you were telling me all three of those things are actually connected <laughs> because a lot of people, a lot of your clients want to know if they have royal blood in them, correct? I think that's one of the big questions when anyone looks at their family tree. The biggest thing is, am I related to royalty? And one of those reasons for that is because the royal family, particularly the British royal family, yeah. are so aspirational and have such a big effect on our lives. Are most people related to them or no? Uh, if you go back far enough, yes. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. Um, I want to ask you, what, what was the one thing as an expert that surprised you about today? I think the thing that people forget is that this has been rehearsed and practiced for a long time. We've had plans in place. You know, Even the idea of the Queen dying in Scotland, it was called Operation Unicorn, and there were plans put in place for what would happen to the Queen uh, from her death all the way to her burial. And the moment that the Queen dies, there's no dead area, there's no space, it's just the king is the mm -hmm. king from that second onwards. And so every single moment from that point on, he's been scrutinised, he's been watched. We want to know what he thinks, what he's going to do, even his choice of name. A lot of people said he might choose one of his middle names as king. He would have been King Edward, King George, and he decided to stick with Charles. And that maybe makes a bit of a statement because the previous two Charleses weren't so well loved. One lost his head, another one was a bit famous for the women. And so the idea that he sticks with that, he's showing some continuity. He doesn't want to reinvent himself. He's the same Charles that we've always known and the one that we've got very used to. Walk us through the next couple of days. We're going to see something spectacular tomorrow, something historical for the first time ever on television. And then I think two days after that, we, we, we may have the Queen's coffin here where people for the first time the public can walk up to it and pay their respects yes so the queen will go from balmoral to hollywood palace where she'll sit privately and the family will have a chance to privately mourn and then there'll be a parade a procession going from hollywood palace to st giles cathedral behind us uh, across the royal mile all the way along and there'll be a private ceremony and then for a day the public will be able to come and pay their respects to the queen from that point She'll take the royal train, she'll go down to London, three days where other people, hundreds of thousands of people will be able to pay their respects, and then she'll later move to Windsor Castle, where she'll be buried alongside her husband and her parents. And, and, and the palace here that you mentioned, it, it, it's, it's Holly Rood, but, but maybe American listeners might have understood Hollywood Palace, which would be a completely <laughs> different thing. Um, I, I want to talk to you about what's going to happen tomorrow on television, because viewers all over the world are going to see something they've never seen before, correct? 
Yes, I, this is a different age. Uh, back in the 1950s, when the Queen was crowned, uh, everyone watched the coronation. Now we've got an era of 24-7 news coverage. We're going to see every part of this. The vigil in St Giles Cathedral is going to be televised. We're going to be able to see inside in a way that we've never been able to before. And that's going to give us a window into a monarchy that famously has been quite closed for the previous decades. And that's going to be something completely new. We're in history as it's being made right now. Do you think we're going to see a lot more of William and Kate? I think so. I think, as today, uh, Prince, uh, King Charles uh, gave the title of Prince of Wales to William and Kate, and one of the things that senior royals do most is charity work. And as King mm -hmm. Charles said, he's not going to have time to devote to his charity. He was famously keen on young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but William is really keen on mental health. He's spoken very openly in a way that, again, monarchs couldn't have dreamed of a few decades ago, and also emergency responders, as he spent some time as a helicopter rescue pilot. And I think we're going to see those charities doing a lot more good work over the next few decades. Okay, Miko Cleland, we thank you so much for your help. And, and you actually helped me right when we started. You said I was I was pronouncing Edinburgh <laughs> the wrong way. What's the right pronouncer? Edinburgh. A lot Ed of people Edinburgh. do it, don't Edinburgh. worry. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try that. Miko, thank you so much for your time. We Thanks appreciate it. Much. The Queen was the bedrock, of course, of the royal family, bridging generations as the world changed. Now that Charles is king, how will the monarchy adapt to today's challenges? Molly Hunter reports from London. I speak to you today. For King Charles the III, the challenge is clear. It all just feels very different. It feels very final now. We've all known just one queen. She's the person that we've always looked up to. With a new prime minister, an energy crisis looming, inflation making life harder here, the country is anxious. I think the next two or three weeks that follow this give be some strange times, not only for England or Britain, but for all Commonwealth countries. While Queen Elizabeth was widely beloved and respected, her eldest son has never enjoyed that kind of popularity. We need some direction as a, probably a country yeah. where we're going to go, but um, whether or not we have a suitable leader in the future, let's um, see how it unfolds. Do you yeah. think the king has it in him? What would you like to see from him? I hope they'll try and modernize the royalty. And part of modernizing will be slimming down. The taxpayer tolerance for funding the monarchy is waning. Do you believe the royal family should continue in its current way? In, not in the current way as it's going, but probably in a lower status, going down a little bit, yeah. Okay. Cutting down on those expenses, cutting down on us funding for them. And bringing his more popular son, his heir William, now Prince of Wales, and wife Kate, into the fold as soon as possible may endear him to a modern Briton. I think he needs to be more, way more inclusive, more diverse, reach out to people, like especially in this time of need, that are on like, like really low. Also focusing on issues like climate change, which he's championed for years that resonate with young people. Yeah. I think the, the Queen's always been really impartial, so it'd be interesting to see whether Charles takes a slightly more bolder stance on issues than the Queen has in the past. It would also connect him more to the younger generation, to a modern Britain. Well, if he focuses on climate change, I think definitely. Molly Hunter joins us now from the Houses of Parliament in London. Molly, you bring up a lot of good points in your story, and I want to ask you, do we know anything about the relationship between the new king and the new prime minister? Because it sounds like they're going to have to work together to get the U.K. through this tumultuous time. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. They are going to have to be in lockstep to have a new head of state and a new head of government all in the same week. Uh, from what I heard from people, it is unsettling. They are nervous. They are uneasy about it. We know that the new king met with the new prime minister today for half an hour. So hoping that relationship was at least a positive first meeting. Uh, but they will really need to be on the same page to lead this country through this period of time, Tom. You know, Molly, I had a chance to speak with some, some younger people of, of this nation today and ask them about the monarchy. And, and, and to my surprise, they, they were sad and they, they were still excited about the monarchy. But that's not exactly maybe the sentiment of all young people. And you touched upon this in your story with climate change. I, I mean, you, you live in this country. Do you, do you think you live in, 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 in the U.K., I should say. Do you think that the younger generation can be brought back into the fold of the monarchy? Can they can they have causes? Can they have reasons to want to sort of follow the monarchy and be behind them and support them, or is that a lost cause? 
Yeah, Tom and I asked a lot of people that exact question today. What will it take? What does King Charles III need to do uh, to kind of get you on side? A couple of things were really obvious. One, to keep uh, the environmental causes, to keep climate change on the forefront like he has for decades. So to keep being outspoken about that, that is a cause we know resonates with young people around the world. The second, to reach out immediately to more diverse communities around the country. Uh, we know that King Charles is going to start traveling uh, to different corners of the United Kingdom to start meeting people almost immediately this week, Tom. Uh, and the other thing is to bring the younger royals up. Uh, the people I spoke with today, Tom, want to see more Kate. They want to see more William. They want to see this younger generation of royals really take a leadership role, and they want to see that quickly, Tom. Still ahead tonight, our coverage from Scotland continues, plus the big changes for the royal family and what it means for the Commonwealth countries. And back in the U.S., new details in that murder of a Las Vegas reporter we've been covering here on Top Story. Did his colleagues help crack the case? Stay with us. And we are back now with power and politics and the legal battle over the top secret documents found in former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. Plus, in an NBC exclusive, Vice President Harris pressed about the DOJ's investigation. Peter Alexander has the latest. Tonight, federal prosecutors are preparing to appeal a judge's decision to block their access to 100 classified documents that FBI agents seized from former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. It comes after that judge ordered an independent review of those materials by a so-called special master. The Justice Department arguing that they are government records, not Mr. Trump's personal records. Mr. Trump's lawyers insist the 11,000 plus record seized should be shielded from investigators because some are privileged. In an exclusive interview for Meet the Press, NBC's Chuck Todd asked Vice President Harris about the investigation. What do you say to the argument? that it would be too divisive for the country to prosecute a former president? I think that um, our country is a country that has gone through different periods of time where um, the unthinkable has happened um, and where there has been a call for justice and justice has been served. That investigation, the backdrop ahead of the November midterms, now less than two months away. President Biden today in Battleground, Ohio, with a competitive Senate race this fall, touting the $280 billion bipartisan package he recently signed to transform the U.S. semiconductor industry. The industrial Midwest is back. Still, top Republicans blame President Biden for record high inflation. Have the Democrats stopped spending? No. I mean, it's just every month there's a new spending bill. This is hurting poor families, people on fixed income. I'm fed up with these guys. As for that investigation, both the DOJ and Mr. Trump's lawyers have until tonight to submit their suggestions who should serve as that special master. Tom. Peter Alexander from the White House for us. Peter, thank you. Next tonight to new details on the murder of a Las Vegas reporter, a local politician, this is so hard to believe, now accused of killing him over the stories that he wrote. And the victim's colleagues may have helped piece it all together. NBC's Gotti Schwartz has more. Tonight, dramatic new developments in the fatal stabbing of noted Las Vegas investigative reporter Jeff Gehrman. In a turn of events reminiscent of the true crime Gehrman covered, a local official who was the subject of Gehrman's explosive reporting now arrested and charged five days after Gehrman was found dead outside his home. Every murder is tragic, but the killing of a journalist is particularly troublesome. Public Administrator Robert Tellez charged with open murder with a deadly weapon. Tellez booked into a Clark County detention center in the same county where he was elected to office and still holds his public title. Appearing in court Thursday after his arrest, he's being held without bail. Investigators say as soon as they learned of the murder, they immediately took into account that Gehrman was a well-known investigative reporter. Tellez was upset about articles that were being written by Gehrman as an investigative journalist that exposed potential wrongdoing. And Tellus had publicly expressed his, uh, his issues with that reporting. On Monday, police released images of who they believed was a suspect. The suspect, as you see here in the photo to my left, your right, was wearing an orange shirt with reflective stripes, a straw hat, and was carrying a duffel bag. And what was likely an attempt to either disguise his identity or conceal his identity. Investigators say they were able to connect the suspect to a maroon GMC Yukon Denali, 
the same car Tellis drives. Gehrman's former colleagues from the Las Vegas Review Journal spanning out to search for leads as well. After the car photo came out was really when um, we tried to look into it more and uh, myself and another breaking news reporter just drove by the house to see if it was there. Police ended up initiating a search warrant saying they found a slew of evidence. We received positive DNA results that showed Robert Tellis's DNA at the crime scene. And a pair of shoes with blood on them and a straw hat saying they were both torn up as a likely way to destroy evidence. We reached out to Tellis's attorney but haven't heard back. Jeff made his share of enemies too. Uh, he he drilled down into politics, into organized crime, into inside the police department. Gehrman had written stories about alleged misconduct and bullying in Tellis's office ahead of Tellis's failed primary run earlier this year. Tellis clearly upset by the reporting in one tweet writing, looking forward to lying smear piece number four by Gehrman, and I think he's mad I haven't crawled into a hole and died. After his arrest, Gehrman's family releasing a statement reading in part, Jeff was committed to seeking justice for others and would appreciate the hard work by local police and journalists in pursuing his killer. We look forward to seeing justice done in this case. And I think it's, I mean, I think it's what Jeff would have wanted for us to report on this as thoroughly as possible and to look into every angle. Again, Tellez is an elected official, so technically he's still the official county public administrator, still receiving a taxpayer-funded salary, and at this point, barring his death, a resignation, or voter recall, it's not even clear how he could be removed from office, but the county says they are reviewing all options under the law. Tom, back to you. Scotty Schwartz for us tonight. Got it. We appreciate it. When we come back, the polio emergency. Traces of the virus found in yet another county in New York. The major move by the state's governor. That's next. And welcome back to the special edition of Top Story. We will have much more on the death of Queen Elizabeth from here in Scotland. But first, we want to go to a plane crash that happened during a flight lesson in California. We have some video that's been coming into the newsroom. Authorities say the small plane made an abrupt upward maneuver before crashing at a Santa Monica airport. The student and instructor on board were both killed. And New York has declared a state of emergency over polio. The virus has now been detected in four counties near New York City and in the city itself since an unvaccinated adult was diagnosed with polio in July. Health officials are urging residents to get vaccinated. And some big changes are coming to Major League Baseball next season. The league will limit time between pitchers and limit defensive shifts in, and increase the size of bases. These new rules are an effort to speed up the pace of play, but also to increase safety. All right, now we want to continue our coverage on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. The entire line of succession now shifting with King Charles now ascending to the throne. And for Prince William and Kate Middleton, new titles and new responsibilities. Here's NBC's Stephanie Gosk. On Wednesday, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge brought their children to the first day of school. George, Charlotte and Louis. By Thursday afternoon, the couple would have new titles and new roles. Their royal lives very different. William and Kate are now the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge, and Prince William is the heir to the throne. He takes over as the Duke of Cornwall from his father, a role traditionally held by the eldest son of the reigning British monarch. It comes with an estate that includes more than 130,000 acres of land, worth over a billion dollars. As Duke, Charles used the money it generated at least in part to fund his charities. In a 2019 ITV documentary, in Prince Charles income, Inside the Duchy of Cornwall, Wales, Prince William recognizing the significance of his future role. Rest assured, I'm, I'm not going to rock the boat. I'll do much the same as what my father's doing. And today, King Charles gave William the title Prince of Wales, making Kate the Princess of Wales, the same title held by William's mother, the late Princess Diana. You're going to be a brilliant princess as well. Earlier this year, the couple moved to a new royal residence, Adelaide Cottage in Windsor, outside of London. At the time, the palace noting they would be taking on far more senior roles in the royal family, something that had already begun as the Queen stepped back from royal engagements. During the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebration in London, this moment on the balcony now even more poignant, the succession to her throne at her sides, a public showing that the future of the monarchy was now in her son, 
and her grandson's hands. The succession to King Charles, now Prince William is first, then his three children. Prince Harry is fifth in line. And as we have noted, King Charles is 73 years old. His reign will obviously be much shorter than his mother's, making William's public responsibilities greater and more scrutinized than ever before. Back to you. Stephanie Goss for us tonight. Stephanie, we thank you for that. For more insight on the royal family's new line of succession, I want to bring in NBC News royal expert Daisy McAndrew. Daisy, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. Before we talk about the line of succession, I do want to start with that moment that we have been talking about and watching over and over again. The first time King Charles came out of that Rolls Royce and, and he greeted the public as the king. For you, for someone who knows the royals inside and out, what, what did you notice about this moment? You're so right to realise that that was significant. That was clearly new King Charles III laying out what sort of monarch he wants to be, what sort of royal family he wants to lead, much more in touch with the people and physically in touch. We saw him being kissed on the hand and kissed on the cheek by people just here at Buckingham Palace. And I think he wanted to say, I do want to be in amongst you. I don't want to be aloof and separate. So although he didn't say anything, he did say a lot. Yeah, the, the other major moment, of course, King Charles remarks, uh, to, to this nation. And, and I have to ask you, you know, he spoke about his son, the new Prince of Wales, Prince William, of course, and the roles him and Kate will have. What, what do you think changes for those two royals right now? It will be a big gear change for them. And, of course, we heard in his address to the people King Charles saying that his son, William, will now be the Prince of Wales and also that Catherine will now be the Princess of Wales. Now, with those titles, of course, comes a lot of responsibility. And particularly, I think, for Catherine, her people around her this evening have been saying she is fully aware of the historical significance of the title that she now has, taking it from Princess of Wales, Diana, Princess of Wales. Of course, the title has been in abeyance since then. Camilla could have taken that title, but I think very wisely it was decided that that would not go down well for Camilla to take Diana's old title. But now it has been passed to Catherine, and that will be significant. And the other thing that I really thought in this speech was worth mentioning was when Charles was talking about how he simply won't have time from now onwards to pursue and to, to bang the drum for all the, his passionate interests that he has been doing for the last 50 years. And we think particularly about the environment there. But he made a point of saying that those close to him will continue his work. And I think that, again, very much talking without saying his name about William, that William will be taking on a lot of the passions that Charles simply can't now because of being head of state. So I, I do have to ask you before you go, Daisy, about the other children, right? Harry and, of course, Meghan Markle. Um, they were acknowledged in King Charles' speech. They, they did not receive any new titles. Do you think that the relationship has to be repaired for this monarchy to survive and to be successful? Or can they move on without Harry and Meghan? They won't want to move on without Harry and Meghan. Of course, they can, in a literal sense. I, I think it was very important and very significant that Harry and Meghan were name-checked in that momentous speech. That speech will go down in history, the first speech by a new king. And for them to be in that speech was very relevant to how we can understand Charles's thinking. He wants to patch things up. We think that his relationship with Harry certainly isn't as bad as Harry's relationship with William is. And, of course, Charles wouldn't, even if he wanted to, be able to give Harry or Meghan new titles because they're not working royals anymore. That, that's not how it works. But I think a lot of people were surprised, pleasantly surprised, that Charles made a point of saying how much he loves them. It could be possibly an olive branch. We're going to have to wait and see. Daisy McAndrew, one of the best in this business, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. Coming up on this broadcast, the Queen and her impact on the Americas. Huge, adoring crowds welcomed her for decades, but there was a strain in the relationship over the legacy of colonization in the Caribbean. That's next. 
Back now with the Americas and Queen Elizabeth's visits there over the decades. Her arrival often welcomed by tens of thousands. This while a strain was clear in the countries in the Caribbean over the legacy of colonization by the British Empire. Juan Venegas has more. A queen that traveled the world from the days of the British Empire to the modern Commonwealth era, it her presence felt in the Americas. More than 100 Commonwealth visits around the world during her reign. The first royal trip to the Caribbean was to Bermuda and Jamaica in 1953, then a major tour to multiple islands in 66. Two years later, Brazil. The goal was to reinforce ties between Britain and the Americas with images of a young queen welcomed by the people. I think uh, she was really part of the more general the boom in celebrity culture more than anything else. I, I don't know that she had any particular uh, political symbolic value. Her official visits included Panama, Chile, and two trips to Mexico. The traditional mariachi serenading the queen after a million locos greeted her in 1975. The Mexicans were expected to give the queen a warm welcome. They're used to turning out the crowds for visitors, but this no, Buckingham Palace officials did not expect anything like this. In Antigua, the queen singing the praises of the small island nation. This lovely island of Antigua, with its sister Barbuda, can form an admirable example of how a small nation can hold its head high among all the nations of the Commonwealth and the world. Yet, the English legacy of the monarchy in the Caribbean and a war with Argentina in the 1980s were ever present. A big debate about the legacies of slavery and British Empire made her a more contentious figure than, than lots of other countries. And then, of course, there's Argentina uh, at the same time where there was a long memory of the 1982 uh, Malvinas and Falklands War. The queen would later face changing attitudes about the monarchy and its reign, most recently Barbados officially breaking away from the Commonwealth last year. From this moment, every Barbadian becomes the living embodiment of the new republic. The queen would welcome the new republic, sharing a statement saying, the people of Barbados have held a special place in my heart. Yet the royal family's relationship to the people of the Caribbean remains strained. There is no question that Jamaica has to become a republic. Just months ago, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge facing protesters in Jamaica and Belize. This is our land. This is our property. But many in the Americas like Queen Elizabeth beyond her title. She was the eternal queen who lived the closest thing to a fairy tale life. Decades on the throne, ending in a modern world where royalty has become much more symbolic, but still very special to many. Guad Venegas joins us now from Miami. Guad, I want to pick up where you just left off there. There are many people that support the monarchy, royalists, who believe that there is no turning back now with some of these countries in the Commonwealth, that this pattern that we see with Barbados and other countries, that they're, it's just going to continue. Is there any way for that to slow down? And, and I mean, what's in it for those countries in the Commonwealth? Uh, Tom, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with now King Charles. Now, you still have uh, some of these nations, the British territories, that recognize the head of the monarchy as their head of state, right? The Barbados no longer does. Jamaica is thinking about moving in that same direction. Now, Charles, when he was still prince a few months ago, did say when speaking to the Commonwealth nations, uh, I could not describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own under understanding of slavery's enduring impact. Now, that statement was very important because he recognized the damage that slavery caused. So now moving forward, it will be interesting to see what kind of symbolic relationship develops between King Charles and all of these countries, even those that no longer recognize the king as their head of state. How will they relate and how they will develop in uh, the future when it comes as members of the Commonwealth and recognize recognizing Charles as their king, Tom. I had a chance to speak with people from really all over the world who were here in Scotland. And when you mentioned the name Queen Elizabeth, they would just light up. And even though they had never met her, they all felt like they knew her. And that speaks to the effect she had on people. We thank you for watching this special edition of Top Story tonight, reporting from Edinburgh, Scotland. We will continue to report from here over the next several days. Thank you again for watching. 
Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.